Hey everybody, welcome back. Mini son of Monster Palooza. I'm just here at my booth all by myself now. A few people walking by, checking things out, having fun at the uh, convention. It's not quite the convention that we uh, that we normally see or that we're normally at, but I, I, I've been enjoying all of my guests. I mean, just so many great people stopping by. You know, I see some folks that are passing over here, and then, oh, here's a group coming. My stuff. Hello. Okay. Okay. Oh, it's the Mitchell family. It's hey, Bruce hey, Mitchell. Hey, hey. Doing? What? Bruce Mitchell. what's up, guys? Oh, hey, uh, you kids, uh, be good. Stop swearing so much, what? and I'll pick you up uh, out front of the bar. Go, go to the bar. All right. Go get a soda pop. Okay. Bruce Mitchell, how you doing? Ted, good. Thanks for yourself for being responsible. We're we're actually seventy three feet apart. I have grown a mustache. <laughs> Is that what you've been doing for a Yeah, COVID? yeah, that's it. That's it. There you go. I like I like how the masks make our yeah, beards all kind of full making of. it easy. <laughs> but I'm doing it anyway. I, I actually just trimmed it for this occasion because it was looking rather castaway. I was gonna say so, you, you were very tired. I was getting looking like a prospector. <laughs> Yeehaw! <laughs> you need a big old hat. Yeah. How you doing? Good man. How are you? Very good. Good to see this you. This is uh, this is going well. I like what you've done with the pace. Oh, thank you so much. The company says it's Bruce. That guy's good at beer drinking. Hey, what a coincidence! <laughs> you know, uh, actually. Uh, real quick, like COVID and stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, it got really easy to like, oh, well, I'm going to get a beer. Well, I'll have some wine. I'll have a little more wine. I got to where I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to kill a bottle of wine tonight. I got to, like, <laughs> all right, stop drinking. And the last beer I had was actually here. So I kind of just, no no drinking. I love drinking. But <laughs> it's, and it wasn't a, a too much thing, but yeah. Uh, one of the things that are always awesome about Monster Palooza is under your table, you can put a cooler. <laughs> and then when your buddies came by, they usually bring two chairs. It's very yeah. much like this. Exactly. Uh, so it's Monster Palooza. Yeah, it's professional <laughs> networking. So yeah. You just get to come over and, and go ahead and have a beer. Well, I've been, I've known Bruce for a long time. We met at Steve Johnson's. Yes, in uh, 2003. Was it 2003? Yeah. Oh my God. Scooby Doo 2. We had we both had darker hair, yeah, more of it. More hair, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. You didn't have kids? No, not at all. Uh, yeah, Scooby Doo too, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Black Knight Project, Black Knight, which, uh, which is a great project. It was really cool at the yeah. time. I, I was really happy to be part of it, and uh, even though it was, and it's like, okay, it's Scooby Doo too. The proportions and bulk of that character, and being people who are into building character. I think immediately we were like, you could turn this into a, is it not, it's not Hammer or Schlemmer, it's a Machine and Krieger. Oh, okay. Uh, I always confuse the two <laughs> at first. But Machine and Krieger are these Japanese models that looked like they came out of World War II. Right. But they're these kind of pod based exosuit characters. And that would be great to have that, that suit. Too bad it ended up in a box at Warner Brothers and probably is in a landfill right now. Right. right I had right. somebody on it. Surprisingly, there's a lot of fans of Scooby Doo too, and I was on a, a fan site recently because I was looking for some pictures on the internet, and I was like, "That's a great picture. I don't have that one." And I go to this site, and they had pictures up that I'd never seen of our suit that we built. Right. And I was like, "This is great." So I started pulling those, and then I got on there, and I was like, "Well, this is who I am. You built the suit." And it's like, "Where's the suit? Where is it now? Is there any chance we could buy it?" And it's like. There's a really good chance it's under like 50 feet of landfill right or now. Sold. Or sold. Or sold for some backdoor deal. I mean, we've seen suits that we've worked on end up in backgrounds and other commercials. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is always really interesting. And it was yeah. that uh, anti-smoking campaign. Right. And uh, we were monsters in it. Right. And there was uh, about 14 people from Legacy got to be monsters in it. And then when we got there, a lot of the background costumes were... the. Uh, armor suit pieces and from oh what was that snow white and the huntsman right and then i recognized costume bits from hellboy 2 right so you can see that this stuff just gets kind of thrown event you know it's all it's all ndas and precious treatment until the film shot and then they've made their money lost their money and then they you know they got to dispense and then they don't want to like, yeah, 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 no, store <laughs> this anymore here somebody else that we i remember what was it it was uh pieces from Oh, what was it? The Avatar, the uh, uh, Last Airbender movie, the M. Night Shyamalan film. Yeah. 
And they were selling it at one of the prop not Yes, a uh, 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 play it again. No, it's a wrap. It's a wrap. Yeah, it's and a wrap we, in October or September always has really Alan cool Alan Scott stuff. had us like run down to it's a wrap. It's like we could put this in our storage area and yeah. possibly, I mean, that's how this stuff works. And yeah. it's amazing because you figure like what, I don't know the budget per se, but how many thousands of dollars per completed suit just to get per in front suit. of the camera. Per yeah, suit. Per suit. Yeah. Uh, and, and many thousands of dollars per suit. And then just to turn around, sell them for fifty bucks. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's, I guess that's the 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 good part about being in Los Angeles is that when something ends up and it's a route. Yeah, we have, have access. I found somebody somebody, somebody texted me about those suits in particular. I bought one. I bought one of those for a completed suit for for one of these knight characters, one of the Queen's Dark Knights, that and we had built a hundred and fifty of them. Wow. And. Uh, I ended up buying a complete one for 135 bucks. That's great. Yeah, well, it was they're it was silly, and it, it it was the most like kind of compromising day because it it felt like theft because it was boxes and boxes of stuff, and my handwriting's on the inside as we were you know writing complete and what it contained, lefts, rights, all this kind of stuff. Right. It, and it felt like I was taking property. Right. But it was, so it just kind of kept looking. <laughs> Am I stealing this? Yeah, I can buy this. It... <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble here. Well, you're the one I'm selling it, so I can yeah. buy it. Yeah. No, it would have been great to repurpose that Black Knight for something. Because it was, like you said, it was a really great... That was, enough, that was a fun outfit. Yeah, I want to put it on a mannequin and put it by my door. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Welcome to my abode. Well, I've always said I really want to... I, I did two foam mock-ups of that. I did a, a, a soft foam. And yes. I did an L200. Yeah. And the L200 was pretty close to the final one that we did, which ended up being vacuum form Kydex. Well, we also... We had... That was a uh, three-month job. And we yeah. had six weeks to produce a working prototype. Right. From, from foam comp to everything that was grown and digitally printed and molded. When we made one super awesome suit, and they said, "No, nix this and this because of the quantities," and then you had six weeks to crank out a hundred and fifty. Right. And I remember it went thirty-five. Oh, for suits. which film was this though? For Snow White and the Huntsman. Snow White and the Huntsman. So yeah. this was thirty-five suits, then fifty-five suits, and then seventy-five suits. So we just kept immediately streamlining the process and uh, stacking on the hours, of course. And I was on there with you because I, I remember it was such a a production line of how we did that stuff. And I think I did shoulders and elbows. Yeah. And that's all I did. Yeah, yeah. For 70 suits or 100 suits or whatever like that because it was all pop riveted together, however, you know, press riveted. And I would just, all of these pieces came to us. Yeah. Someone else was grinding them Yeah. in the model shop. You know, the, the, the mold shop was cranking out these pieces, handing them over to the model shop to it grind them down. It was a spray and, polyurea technique that made the job possible. Right. Uh, for yeah, spraying yeah. the molds, or else they would have never been able to brush them. But then everybody, what pieces were you specifically? Uh, myself and Trevor were shop leads on that, so it was a lot of counting. I think I assembled more chests than anything else, but also component parts. Right. Uh, so yeah, I was shoulders and elbows. So I, I, from from here to here, that was me. Yeah. So then you had an, a, another person or two people like, doing the hands. Another Jeff person. Himmel was doing hands or feet. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, and these pieces Blanks just on kept that, on getting on that. dumped onto your table, and yeah. you would you know, okay, this is left. This is insanity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just because of sheer numbers, but it was a really neat. Suit. It's a fun job. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. No, they're very. Oh, it was also for Colleen Atwood, who's that right. uh, amazing, highly, you know, awarded, acclaimed, acclaimed yeah. yeah, costume designer. So yeah. I, I get, I love geeking out about that kind of stuff. Right. In the job, when you meet uh, designers, you get to meet stuff. that designer. Yeah. Can I tell you a quick story? Of course. It's it's. Uh, no, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> no, it was, a, it was a Colleen Atwood story, which you know we worked with so many different times at Legacy. Yeah. And uh, she's uh, mainly Tim Burton's costume designer for yeah. most of his films. They collaborate often, so we were doing. Uh, Tim Burton was production designing. Um, the Halloween party for the White House for oh, um, right. Barack Obama's I'm, yeah. first term. Yeah. And so Tim Burton was art directing the Halloween party. And this is all like, we're just doing this because we want to do it. He came into the shop. Here's what he wants. And then Colleen Atwood was like doing the costume work, of course, but just all pro bono type stuff. And we were going to do a Boon Raku style zero. Mm -hmm. from Nightmare Before Christmas and then a Jack Skellington and so my job was to fabricate a little bit of the Jack 
the torso and all that kind of stuff. But then I had to sew the costume, the tuxedo, and put that together. So I did, you know, the, the pants and the shirt and the whole bit. Colleen Atwood came in on the weekend when I was working, and she looked at my muslin thing, and I didn't, you know, I sew so that it looks good on the outside. Right. You know, I'm not a suit builder uh, or, you know, like a, I'm not a tailor by any means. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I had a suit jacket there that I'd basically taken apart, figured out how to do it. She comes in, takes a look at it, and she says, oh, this is beautiful. This is really nice. Here's my mock-up, and here's my thing that I'm actually proceeding with. She says, so I don't understand. How did a tailor end up in a makeup effects shop? I said, I'm not a tailor. I said, I cut foam, and I make rubber monsters. And she's like, you're a fantastic sewer. It was like, thanks. I just I took apart a suit jacket and figured out how to put it together. She goes, that's fantastic. So yeah. I got a nice pat on the back from Colleen Atwood, who thought I was a tailor. So That's awesome. And that's, that's what I always say about fabrication. I'm a fabricator, which means I just make stuff up for a living. So sure. That's what it's about. It's it's a, it is a it very up. in-between position. It's like we've, we've, we've worked on, and these are, this guy's looking great. Now. Thanks. But uh, also any foam fabricators out there, this gill work, I hope you do close-ups to that later because it's pretty stuff. I, I, I'm, I'm sharing everything on Instagram. Awesome. You know, uh, pictures and... It's re it really is an in-between job because a lot of times if I'm not fabricating and then there's body shopping to be done, I'll, f I'll filter my way into uh, wearable hard surface stuff right. because it's going to come to us later. So if we can have hands and eyes on it earlier, right. it, uh, it benefits the process. So right. it is an in-between stuff. And, I've, you know, any one of us, I think, jump in between other positions in the shop and... Uh, that keeps you employed longer too. Right. I mean, yeah, and we've talked about that a lot about being diverse and having diverse skills. Yeah. You know, being able to and, and, and not being too precious about who you are and what you do in the shop. Oh no. I mean I've yours. always I'm a fabricator. Yeah, yeah. But I like to sculpt and I like to do this and every now and again at Legacy or K and B or even Steve Johnson shop. They knew I could sculpt a little bit. Yeah. And it was, it was, oh, well, we need some help on this. It's like, oh, Ted, you're a decent sculptor. So why don't you do a little sculpting? Okay, right. great. So, you know, but that's the that's the hero job. Everybody wants to sculpt. Oh, yeah. But I always told all of my bosses, it was like, do I have work on Monday? It's like, I'll scrub toilets if you want me to. Yeah. And there's a lot of times I, I scrub toilets at the shop. That's fine. You know, for the same rate or whatever like that. And then if you're there, you're in the shop, you're seen. It's like, you know, it's like, don't be proud about any of your work. It's oh, like, no. It because all it's all the same. I get paid the same whether I'm fabricating or sculpting or, or I go scrub to the toilets. <laughs> scrub the toilets or I go to the mold shop and I'm helping tamp glass or mm -hmm. pour some polyfoam or some latex or, you know, all the different shops I worked at. I ended up anywhere all over the place because right. I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. Well, also, you apprentice until they find you find they and they knit you around until until a lead in one of those departments goes like, no, 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 he's indispensable in this position. Right. And that's kind of how it works. It's like and everybody was, wants to sculpt. Uh, not everybody wants to be in the mold shop, but it's solid work all right. the time, and it's right. absolutely necessary. And, well, and yeah, I could use way more boning up on my. Mold, mold, your mold shop skills, yeah, your absolutely. tech skills, yeah. absolutely. And that's right. Sorry, I mean, I learned how to make some great molds from a lot of guys who are makeup artists. That said, this is the way you make a mold because a really good appliance has to come out of this mold. Yes. Not just one, but twenty. Yeah. Or Fifty. Yeah. So you like need that. So this is how you do this, and this is your skin coat, and here's your second, and here's this. So you know, you it's all of these skills are great to have, and that's what I've always said is starting out in the smaller shops back when I started out in, in 89 and 90, where you're doing everything. You know, you're, you're doing the sculpting, the molding, the casting, the painting, the mechanizing, and then you take it to set and you puppeteer it or whatever. Right. You know, and I, I, there's not a lot of shops like that anymore because it's all like, nope, you're a fabricator, you're a sculptor, you're a mechanic, you're this, because some of these shows are so quick. They're really fast now. And big. I mean, like, even the big shows are fast shows. You the, know? the last one that seemed like it had any time, it had prep, and then a commitment of uh, almost 30 suits. No, over 36 suits? Was it uh, Pacific Rim? That's oh, the last yeah. one I remember having a lot of time on. Well, and Dark Crystal. Dark okay. Crystal. That's uh, right, you work on Dark Crystal. Yeah, the, uh, the Re Age what? of Resistance. Age of Resistance, okay, yes. yeah. yeah. The, the Netflix one. Yeah. And that, that took a long time, too, but there's literally... Like a hundred characters. I think when you're doing a film like that, though, I think they probably understand what they're getting into, and they have to have the time to create. They should. I'm sure they they are. Like, <laughs> oh man, you know, of course we could do it. Look at the other ones. You know, yeah, we got this. And then you you get it, and then it's just this monster of work. Right. And they and they got it done. How much time did you have for that? Who? The reworking of that. 
that was a few years ago uh several months i was actually i got this i actually sculpted a lot of stuff on that one for costume pieces so i wasn't sculpting the skexies themselves but i was sculpting their components for their costumes okay their carapace things yeah uh and then once that was completed i went on to the costume side and i worked on uh some gelfling armor and uh other attributes of Skeksis and characters like that. Now, what do you think is, what's the longest amount of time you've had on a show? Oh. Where you just kind of go, wow, this is great. We're going to have a lot of chunk of time to create this thing. Well, even uh, when you have a lot of time, usually if you have a lot of time, there's a lot of suits. So there's right. so many things. So you're, you're dividing up that giant span of time to where it, it never feels like you have enough. You're always chasing the schedule. But uh, right. uh, yeah, Pack Rim or Dark Crystal. Yeah, that was your most Pacific Rim, Pack Rim, Pac Rim. industry folks and <laughs> Mingos. I mean, uh, I remember it, it. It felt like such a long time, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday. Um, from dusk till dawn, felt like we had a ton of time. And that's right. We both worked at KMB, but we never worked there no, at the no. same time. I left, and then you you popped in maybe a year after or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. I, I think I started working there in in 1999. Okay. And uh, and then off and on. And I, I, I've actually, I left I actually in worked 99. there last year this time. Is it this time? What, what month is it? We don't know, <laughs> we don't know anymore. We're not counting. Nobody's it's, counting months or hours. It's 2020, man. Exactly. Something like uh, that. In 2019, I worked there. Okay. On, uh, yes. Uh, I don't know. Is that still going? Did that get canceled? They announced the, the movie, so I guess you can say. Right? Space Jam 2. It's, oh, it's still, it's I didn't to say, hey, you know what a big sports fan I am. It's the one with <laughs> yeah, the ball. Yeah, sport ball. Sport ball. It's sport the ball. sport ball. It's the uh, hoop sport ball. Hoop ball. Hoop there ball, but with cartoons. Okay. Excellent. Can't and uh, <clears throat> the hoop baller meets a cartoon guy, and they sport ball together. And then there's other cartoon sport ballers. Hoop sport ballers. Excellent. I and they, uh, they do the thing, the nice. sport ball. So what were you doing on that? Uh, you say? It was it, it, just I, I can't. Stuff. Although, no, I can't. You were in fabrication. I was in fabrication. Okay. I was making costumes. We won't say anything about. And that. then, other than that, I can't. I so, can't when you worked on Mandalorian season three, what did you do for? No, I'm kidding. Oh, uh, of this. <laughs> I was going to dive right into something like totally fake, but it's all I, I fan theory. The, I'm waiting for the Disney police car to come exactly. scratch you. Dude. It's like neither one of us worked on season three of Mandalorian. I I haven't worked on an or two. Also, I didn't work on Mandalorian at all, and that is. <laughs> Both one of those things where I'm like a pouty little child about it, like, hey, you could have called me. You knew what a big dork I was about this particular character, and yeah, yeah, yeah. But then at the same time, hey, Bruce, I worked on it. I know, and you know, you could have called me because you know David what it worked on it. You know, you could have called me and saw my little my man dork shrine in my house. Yeah. But uh, actually, it, I kind of I really enjoyed the series myself, and I know that from working on stuff. It's in your head as you work on it, so you can't help but like break it down. Well, how's this going to pay off? What's he going to do? What's this character's motivation? Yeah. I think we get more time than the actors do often to develop the idea of what we think the character is going We're to be. We're developing a whole other story in yeah. our head. And often you go to the movies and this is... <laughs> this is crap. <laughs> this is stupid. See, look how restrained Bruce is. No, when I'm... Steve Johnson was here, Jesus, blah, blah. I See, I'm doing this too. impression. Steve, I'm, I'm yeah. doing this impression again. I'm sorry, Steve. I'm not going to do any more impressions of you. But uh, yeah, <laughs> he had. So he just has hearts in his eyes. Do more, Steve. Hey. Oh, he loves Steve. Hey, was, you, was Steve actually on it? That's him just now. Like, oh, hey, hey, hey like, you're fucking me. What is this shit? <laughs> what are you gonna? And I, there was a job. It was Jarhead. I actually really used cereal and latex to achieve this burned texture. So, are you really gonna fucking use cereal? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how this works <laughs> that, that, that kind of thing and uh, it, it worked pretty good Dude, we had a great set I mean, we were talking about this all over you know with Steve and just like you know that, that creativity that that he just like yeah let's let's use cereal let's do that does it look right does it look you know let's let's invent something new or let's let's use something old yeah you know and, and let's make it new again or something like that uh, so. it, the, the, my favorite Steve quote where we're like well, what, is, what does that mean and uh, it's, it was one, it was like, to me, it, it meant sort of that Terry Gilliam theatrical opera look. He goes, I don't know, I think it needs a little more of that uh, British production design. Just 
just kick that in there. I'm gonna <laughs> give it British. You know, that kind of thing. So <laughs> that we're all like, oh, we're British. British. <laughs> what is it? We were, I just thought quick, somebody look up some British production designers. I, I don't I know thought, what that means. I thought texture plays in the back row. Yeah. That kind of well, thing. Well, and that, that, that was a great thing. It's like, yeah, we, we'll give Steve more compliments here. Is uh, uh, one thing I, I honestly learned from him because I, I was all of a sudden transitioning into kind of a pseudo customer. Yeah. Where I started doing costume work. And it's like, sometimes I was the only person in the shop doing it. Yeah. I mean, I built a couple of costume um, for, for Steve. For like his Halloween. Steve just has a big ha 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 ha. <laughs> but, um, you know, but it's it's adding those details. Yeah. I remember working on a costume for a commercial and Steve said, I like that. What more are you going to do to it? And it's like, well, I guess we'll age it down a little bit. He goes, no, no, no. You got to dress it up more. You, you know, it's it's got to have a belt, but something's got to be on that belt. Create a character. You know, the necklaces. What kind of necklace should it have on? And it was like these orc type characters. Yeah, now let's awesome. la- layer the, the fabric. Stuff, man. Layer the, the fabric and start start doing this. And maybe a bandolier of this. And that's when I started getting into it needs more. Because yeah. that's the thing is it, it reads so small on film. You know, it's like if you don't do enough to it, if you, you know, you always have to step back or take a photograph of it. You know, and that'll tell you what you're seeing. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, that's really plain. That's really simple. I need to dress this up. I need to give this character. Absolutely. And with it, with yeah. stuff like necklaces, it can either be just like a braided piece of leather with a tooth on it, or you start to go, no, that tooth means he killed that beast, and right. this is what they are. And he's the chief, so he needs to have a dozen of them, and it also needs to have beads in between. That beads means how many seasons he was the chief. Right. Blah, blah, blah. You get to get all... You create anthrop- a story. Yeah, anthropological with your characters. It's, it's, it's like, like, you know, you look at the... the well, not the old movie, but the newsreels of, like, you know, World War II or Vietnam and all that. And the guys that, you know, wrote their hometown names on their... And are customizing their, their equipment. Yeah, You know, absolutely. and it's, it's them. They've it's got- shark teeth on World War II planes, and it's the Maasai warriors with the tusks and the AK-47s. Right. It's the... That's it's what am I looking at and how when you let the human element run over the technology, right. you just get the the coolest hybrids. Yeah, it's it's, it's that richness of, of texture and stuff yeah. like that. And it's so. also it's that stuff I never need to have explained right. in a story. And it would it would make it lame if they tried to. But if right. you see it and you you're savvy enough well, or you're interested enough. Go back to Star Wars. I mean, look with in Empire Strikes Back with Boba Fett. Yeah. And he's got these braided hair thing. It's like, we don't know. Yeah. He's got this off-kilter cape. And, and that badass skull tattoo. Yeah, and it's like, what's that all about? But it's like, they never tell us. No. You know, they told us years ago because somebody made up a history to that character. Right. And they oh, needed this is, clues to fan fiction. This is, this is what it is. And it's like, well, is that what it was? Or was that just some, again, some production designer, some costume builder? And it's like, hey, we got these hair braids. Let's put some hair braids on. That, that might look neat. Maybe he yeah. killed a beast or something. And you know, but then there's this folklore that they make up later. But those are all those neat little details that go into a costume that, you know, again, it, it, with a lot of your personal work, too, that there's all that detail work. Because you've done so much work just on your own, like yeah. Wasteland Weekend type stuff. And that tells a story. Absolutely. That's yeah. uh, That would be going on this weekend, actually. Oh, is it? Yeah. No, but it's a lot canceled. of people can see that kind of work. I mean, which, what Instagram handle... Uh, look me up on Conceptual Executioner, Conceptual underscore Executioner, or just look up Bruce D. Mitchell. Yeah. And um, uh, actually, it's like this little logo. That's the logo. For that guy. That's right the there. logo. Mm. And uh, everybody thinks that's a space jockey. And I'm okay with that because that's pretty <laughs> rad. Uh, <laughs> but that's one of Bruce's masks. I mean, when I first started seeing your mask that you yeah. did, you know, outside of your your work within the shops. Yeah. And it was like so inventive with the magnets and it's like, you know, wearable art. You know, Thanks, like, I brought one. Let me just I know uh, you. Let's throw, let's throw it up here. Oh, you know, I brought a couple things. Cool. Uh, I was watching this, and we were, everybody's talking about uh, where they started or their interests. So I just yeah. kind of went, I went to my bookshelves. I got a ton of books. Cool. And I just, I wanted to bring and say, this is my, this is what I identify with. But um, this is a piece I'm, I'm working on now. Hold it up just a little bit. There you paper. go. So this is actual real horns, and um, it's not kudu horns. It's... Uh, Ibex or something like that, but I got them on eBay off a of school plate. But the material itself is an epoxy clay, much like Magic Sculpt, which I usually go to. Mm-hmm. But you gave me this. Okay. Like, this is the whole kit. Is it working? It so far. It I, worked. Yeah. <laughs> it's not good. If it turns back to goo, I'm gonna be really sad. No, no, I should be. Yeah. But this is that whole kit, and oh, uh, wow. I've only used just a little bit more in the ears. 
but uh, this is a build up over a life cast that has clean clay upon it. And uh, I've also got goggles that'll set in here. You can see there's uh, still some release because I needed to bridge out the piece that's going to be the goggles. But this is all built up and then sanded down using uh, heavy files and then Dremels. Right. But uh, this will be in an art show coming up at the Copro Gallery called Roadside Attractions 4. And that'll be on October 10th. I think they're going to do a limited entry, you know, sure. social distance limited yeah. entry. And then they'll... Uh, They'll totally let people see it virtually, I believe. This so when do you have to have this done? Next week. Okay. Which is fine. I'm actually, I'm actually <laughs> way ahead. Well. If I had to finish this in two more days, I could. Because right. I've got all my pieces done. I've sure. got uh, pads pre-cut. But this will be a one-off. So the idea behind this, this is, like you say, wearable art. But most Correct. people don't wear these. I mean, you... No, these usually get bought by... And uh, I've, I've only got two left. I've made of over 25... Uh, since I've made them and I sell right. them as one-offs. There's very few that get committed to having a mold made and uh, Of the patrons that do pay the prices I want uh, They're like it look if you mold these I'm not I'm gonna I'm not gonna pay that price right right so, uh, But it's also it's no, that they're deal, one-of-a-kind like, art yeah. right so if you pay five grand for a, a finished piece Which is a freaking deal for the man hours that go sure. into it versus what I would make in a studio Right right or they would pay at a studio if if I sell it for five grand or if I take the Let's say, how much is that going to cost to make a decent mold of this? I'm going to right. need a few, it's going to be a three-piece mold, at least. I'm going to try right. to capture the inside. I'm going to spend at least $300 on that, plus the materials to run, if it's successful, to find it. And then sell them for what? 500 each? I'd have to sell 10 to get to where I get for the five all, grand. All of the work. So it's yeah. a, and if I sell through galleries and I sell one-offs, it makes me more... There's the, the people that do pay those prices, want those one-offs, and they... they they treasure them. They, I'm, I'm in some awesome collections. Yeah. Uh, oh, you know what? Check that out. Feel that. Tell me what the weight is. Oh my God. That's right. It's about 47 pounds, everybody. <laughs> now this is like super. What is this? Like a pound? I don't know. It's it's not it's not over two. No, it's definitely not over two. But I mean, it's structural. Obviously, it's the, the heaviest the material. Ma uh, oh, it's uh, smooth on magic. No, smooth on freeform sculpt. Freeform sculpt, not yeah. freeform air, and I was gonna. I, I do tend to use freeform air if I need to fill in pockets because it is so marshmallowy. Yeah, I don't know if you see the inside. So yeah, Bruce, like you said, he's sculpting this around a life cast, but then you you bulk up clay the life cast. that life cast with a, a clean clay essentially. Right. Or it's now it's called CK two, I think, but it's a, a mold barrier clay, and I make yeah. a sort of the generic form of this character, and then I build this up and, and dremel it down or file it down. The thing I do like about this material is because it's so tough, I can build directly on top of it with more. It does bond to itself nicely, which uh, you make sure you have to release it right? Uh, when you put more pieces on. Right, so if you want to sculpt the piece that you want to be able to come off, because you do this with magnets. Yeah, yeah. You'll you'll have, have, you'll have, I actually have, learned that trick at Steve Johnson's when okay. it was one of the Scooby-Doo characters. It was like, oh, it would have gotten away for you, too, if it wasn't for you damn kids. Oh, it was uh, uh, Evil Mass Figure. Evil Mass Figure. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't. I think I saw the movie. But, uh, uh, you know, I think my kids saw it. Uh, but uh, he, Eric Fiedler had, had yeah. this mask that came off and it had small neodymium magnets or rare earth magnets that registered into place so it could easily come off but it was secure enough to be on there and you couldn't shake it off or wouldn't fall off right i thought that was genius so one thing that that uh has been amazing in this career as is, is to go around and glean techniques from other artists right. and to see you know you see other shops use other key tricks and whatever right. But uh, uh, magnets is something I've gone and applied into my own stuff. No, and I, I you know, same thing. And everybody All these does. little side jobs and things like that that I do, and it's like, magnets, yeah, no Velcro, no this, and you use the rare earth magnets that really snap on, but they're easy enough to pull off, yeah. and it, it, it holds really well. We did a lot of that stuff on the first Iron Man. Oh, yeah. So when he's actually moving and those plates are shifting and stuff, so that he can reach forward and the, the, the chest plates kind of move a little bit, and they were on elastic and they'd snap back into yeah. place. So they, when it registers in place when they're back and they don't just kind of hang. Yeah, through. they don't hang there. So it just yeah. like snaps back into place. Oh, the uh, the other thing I did, I wanted to I wanted to just show is uh, we go back to an era before internet. Yeah. Right? Before, I mean, there was internet, but it was like your dumb When we matrix. were kids trying to research how to do this stuff. We had to look it up on parchment. <laughs> and, and parchment collected into books. But I brought, I, I looked at my uh, uh, shelf and I brought a bunch of books that 
that to me I just wanted to go through. They're artists that I really like now and yeah. stuff that has always inspired me. Excuse me, Space Wizard. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> And a kick-ass backpack and as well. a kick-ass ruck. That's that's the equivalent of the iPhone now. <laughs> this, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is this was our iPhone back yeah, in the day. This was true. our iPhone. It was a giant backpack, and take it over to your buddy's house. Look at these books I got. Yeah. You mean you had to use your hands? Uh, uh, well, as, as long as they're a big pile. I don't want the magazines to tear anymore. No, exactly. I it's think uh, I've got half of these. Books. Exactly. Let's pull them out. So. Mike. Got it, got it, want it. Oh, want sure. It, got it. <laughs> oh, you still have that. Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. I loved it. I started to get these magazines, these magazines, got Return it. of the Jedi. Got it. Uh, these were the ones that told me that special effects was a career. So back in the 80s, you'd get this. And then there's like a few pages in the back that show you design, miniature art, uh, miniature sets, things right. like that. Uh, this one was 2010. Uh, again, it's it gets to work of Sid Mead, and then there's the fiberglass child that they see again. Uh, what do they call that? The star child, star, star baby. baby. Yep. Uh, and then it's it's it goes on and on about the miniatures. But uh, this is stuff, I started to notice that those guys reappeared in these magazines all the time. Yeah, so that you started seeing the same names all Apogee, the time. Apogee, uh, uh, Boss Films, ILM, Horror. This was like the badass one that, that Fangoria put out, I believe. Yeah, Fangoria yeah. Presents. But this one had, this was strict makeup. This was like the Bible of good stuff to learn and know. Now, a lot of these guys are, I think, still in the business. I, I had the issue. Because how can you that. retire, yeah. right? How's your My favorite was plan? Gore Zone. Gore Zone was garbage. Gore, I love Gore Zone because the last like four pages or so. Gore, Gore Zone, Zone was Gore Zone was schlock. And they, and it, they had um the la but the love the last four pages or so that they would do like this behind the scenes and yeah, yeah. talk about the chemicals and the materials they're using and Sin Magic. Sin, I love magic. Sin magic. This is this was the how to, uh, and it this this took every technique from stop motion animation. To melting heads and showed you how to do your own. Showed you how to do your own and ball joint amateurs. Now thanks to the internet and eBay and things like that, you can still find this stuff. Yes, you can. Uh, so Cinemagic, Cinemagic, Amazing Cinema was another one. I'm huge into doing miniatures. When yeah. I when I came down here originally, I, I had more miniature work in my uh, my book. So I immediately got once I came down from a I came down from the Bay Area, and it was if you did effects, you did monsters, you did models, you did sets, you did everything. And then I came down here, and it was a bigger market, so it was much more niche, right? Mm -hmm. If you if it looked like you did more of one thing, that's where the, that's where you went. Right. So I started out in uh, miniatures down here, working at uh, Grant McEwen Designs real quick, and then uh, Digital Domain for a couple years, and then I got into Imagineering for a little bit, and then KMB, because okay. all the stuff just transferred there. So more Sin Effects. And Cinefix. Cinemagic. Oh, Cinefix too. That was a big one. But everybody wow, seems to know that that's one. My, yeah. That's my, my over there. Yeah, everybody knows about them. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> this is an amazing book. I'm going to go through some of these really ten? quickly. In ten minutes? Ten minutes. All right, ten minutes. We'll do this quick. I highly recommend <clears> you get this book. This is a breakdown skeletal and mus musculature. Yeah. There's a lot of great alien designs it's, out there. That it's look like, know your anatomy. Yes, please. We've talked about this before. Like, know the people. I mean, some of these great books... It's just there, there's so many great, I mean... Oh, there's I, guys that fully break the rules that are some of my favorite artists, but they yeah. knew the rules. I've, I've got that book. Yeah. You know, there's so many of these where it's just like such great artwork, but it's just learning Brom. from when he, he just exploded. Yeah, this was the most beautiful cross between like vampire, space alien, Mad Max stuff. Yeah. So this was dark future and, and it's interesting watching some of the films where all of a sudden that influence yeah ghost of mars see, did, yeah, ghost of this was our book right that's where we, we he did brahm did drawings i still got copies of them but then uh it got to well we're out of characters we need like 30 more characters so dark works the section became our go-to for for character attributes to grab and create for ghost of mars that was also my first uh leather work okay. where i got to go crazy on leather uh, fine arts wise, I'm pretty. I, I like the fine arts scene a lot. Uh, I highly recommend checking this guy out, Kenji Yanobi. Uh, he does. He's a Japanese 
artist does these huge pieces, but these are all metal work, is that like glass found work. Art type? Some of it's Some found of it. art, but a lot of it is actually constructed. Uh, and he's got, I mean, everything from submarines to, I think he would have been great. I don't know what's in the upcoming Dune, but he, he could have done stuff. They could have gotten rid of the baby doll face and changed some stuff up. Uh, this is the other thing that told me that, that this is a job. And this I got when I was 14 or 15. And I lived in Santa Rosa at the time. So I used to stalk this company. There's, there's pictures in the background in Cinefax and Star Trek IV, the one with the Klingon bird of prey and the whales and the... But they, uh, they go, but they're doing outdoor shots. And we just went to Marin and went to all the industrial complexes and went, that's the building right there. If you look at the terracotta in the <laughs> stone, that's it. Look at the parking lot size. And we just kind of snooped around until ILM's uh, security, uh, some hippie in it. Get out of your kid. Yeah, pull over, uh, kick this out. Uh, this is uh, Ashley Wood. Uh, Ashley Wood's an amazing artist. And I'm showing these mainly because they're influential to me, but I also wanted to show a wider berth than all that. Everybody's all like, oh, Lugosi all day, right? Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, I like that stuff too, but man, it's a bigger, cooler world out there. Uh, at Intron Depot, again, Japanese influence, Appleseed. And he's got like three books that are kind of that right. style. Where it's and all this is good. right before he went digital right. in most of his work. Uh, Heavy metal was a huge influence. Yeah. So we got Overlord here, which is, uh, I believe that's Wonga. No, this is uh, Oscar Chichoni, and this is Juan Gimenez. No, Chichoni Gimenez. Gimenez just passed away. Uh, Chichoni's still kicking. Also on Pacific Rim, uh, Guillermo del Toro is a big artist fan. He, he ended up having uh, Chichoni do a few drawings of the Russian suits. Spectrum. Spectrum 17. Spectrum, I'm, I'm in this one. I'm in seven spectrums so far. And it's again, it's my personal work. But this guy here, this guy here, this is huge to me. This means a lot. Yeah. These are the, the things like I, I'm way into all this kind of art, yeah, art, design, design, art. Skillful Huntsman. I brought I this because one. I feel like this, although I believe this came out of a, an effort within the, the Art Center School of Design. Yeah, I think so. This, this pretty much is the way modern production design is done as far as uh, character creation, world building. Uh, this book is uh, a must. This is old school. In fact, your dog chew on the corner of that or I've something? I've had this since it was new. <laughs> Space Yoda. I remember in the 90s when Movie Magic was on Discovery, I would call California Information and get the numbers for a lot of effects houses and just ask questions until they got annoyed. I did that too. I did, yeah. that, I did that with ADI. Uh, I think we were talking about everybody. earlier. It's like, you know, so back in the day when you could actually knock on doors and actually. Yeah. And then Gabriel yeah. Garcia says those are the same books I have in my collection. Right on. Also, uh, Phil Hale, another artist, Love amazing him. artist. Yeah. And actually, we did some work with him at Legacy. I got him to sign this book. Cool. And uh, uh, yeah, he wrote a note, too. So let's see. Uh, Takeya Takeyuki is another guy who is in the Japanese world is just a master diorama uh, character designer. Yeah. Um, you recognize some of that stuff. He he signed another book for me at a Monster Palooza and it was right as Monster Palooza was opening and it was he takes his time and it's this beautiful calligraphy when he writes his kanji in his name and he's and I just wanted to hurry up. Oh yeah, this I don't have my old D&D &D books anymore. But I got that, uh, you know, that Dungeon Master Shield, at least uh, two pages of it. But that's some classic <laughs> callback there. Nerd. Yeah, absolutely. And and I gotta say, I think it's a lot easier these days with the internet at yeah. your fingertips. And also, you being a nerd isn't so. The isn't, interior of all of these books is on the internet. Yeah, just look exactly. Up those but please go back through that and look at those titles. Expand your universe a little bit if you're not involved in this kind of scene. These kind of scenes are the ones that the designers that deep dive a little bit outside of just pure monster tradition right. seem to uh, bring up again. No, and that's, I mean, back. putting all of this stuff into the whole monster, you know, monster palooza and just making these worlds collide and all that kind of stuff, it's just, that's what you want. You're melding of these universes and melding of looks and bring something different to the table. Absolutely. You know, thing. Also, anybody out there, I see a lot of people like, how do you get into the business? Uh, you get into the business by... Uh, showing your work and showing you're capable of being in the business and doing a lot of work. <coughs> you <coughs> have do to do your own work. You got to you got to do your work, and it's you know, do your work, show your work, 
call up the shops. Also, it's like please check out my page. But also, I think in, in my uh, in my profile and that's conceptual executioner. I think I have one thing that I that I worked on in the effects world. I don't usually show the stuff because that always gets a hotbed issue, and somebody's always pissy about it later. And they don't they may not say it. And you'll find out you'll find out later. Maybe a year later at a party, so and so said this after you posted that. <laughs> it's like, well, then I I was part of that, right? Then I that was the part I had to right. write. But it's too easy for somebody to look like they're claiming credit. You're always really good about sharing and I, including I try, people. you know, that's the thing is we work on these projects and you know, but they're team efforts, right? They're, they're they're massive team effort team efforts. And I try to post on Instagram specifically what I worked on and say what did I do on this project. Yeah. And I just say for the good every, stuff. For, what's that? The good stuff. I did all the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. No, just to know that everybody, there's, you know, there's other people, you know, from concept art to sculpting, molding, all, right. all these different departments that all have to touch this. And, and it's like, this is the part that I touched. As craftspeople, yeah. I think it's super easy to get attached to and involved with the stuff that you put your passion to. I mean, this is right. stuff that we're all ridiculously passionate about. Right. Uh, passionate about. But uh, at the same time, it's not ours. It's going to be taken away. It's going to be put on the big screen. It's going to be turned into toys. No matter what you had involvement on, that's where it ends. Maybe you get a credit. So it's important that you do your own work or you're going to go nuts. Yeah. You're going to feel completely used. and. Uh, you know, but, you know, if you want to do your it, own work, sit in your own shop and make your own stuff. Absolutely. I <laughs> highly recommend that. It makes the job a, a job and it makes the job enjoyable. I like to look at it as like this. Things I learn on the clock are tricks I get to use later. Right. I like to do my best work, the best work I can for the jobs I'm on. But at the same time, I like to steal any tricks I can. Yeah. <laughs> well, we got to wrap it up. Right. Um, we're going to get going into our next person. We're going to take a little break here. Bruce, hey, thank man. you so much for coming by. Hey, it's a pleasure. And you got to uh, find your kids. I yeah, don't know what booth they went to over is, here. Uh, my booth is out that way. That way and down bit. away. Make sure yeah, that yeah. they're guarding your booth. Yeah. Hopefully they got their foot on the beer cooler. Absolutely. And nobody's taking it. So thanks again for coming by. Hey, it's a pleasure. I appreciate man. it. All right. Cheers. We're going to take a little Thank break you. and we'll be right back. Thanks, everybody.